Good morning, class. Today we're going to talk about special operations and how to not suck at it. So let's get into it. So today we're talking about special operations, aka spec ops. Spec Ops is a very interesting game mode for many reasons, and it definitely gets the biggest range of reactions. Many people love it, many people hate it. Spec Ops is actually the first ranked game mode you unlock, and the first we're discussing in this series. What I mean by that is that it has two different sets of rewards, daily and weekly. Like other game modes, Spec Ops has a set of rewards for completing it for the first time each day. You'll receive 50,000 gold, 300 squad XP, 8 to 12 sign particles, which are used for crafting regional costume pieces, a 1 to 3 star core box, and a 1 to 3 star special operations costume box, which has a chance to drop a regional costume piece from the featured region of the Spec Op. We'll briefly get more into regional costumes in just a bit, however, because Spec Ops is a ranked game mode, this means you can actually replay Spec Ops as much as you'd like throughout the day to try and improve your score. Your best score from each day is saved to a weekly total score. At the end of each week, you'll receive ranked rewards shown here, which are based on your weekly total score. This, of course, resets each week. The ranked rewards are costume boxes that have a chance to drop rare regional costume pieces from Xander, Sakaar, and Hydra Empire. Now you may be wondering, what the heck are regional costumes, and why are they so important? Well, let's pause here to briefly explain regional costumes, also known as regional gear. I'll probably end up making a video all about costumes in the near future, but when it comes to Spec Ops, I do want to at least stress the value of regional costume pieces. Regional costume pieces are easily some of the most valuable, if not the most valuable items you can acquire in Marvel Future Revolution. As you may have guessed, there are two types of costumes, regional and non-regional. All costume pieces belong to sets which provide set bonuses that when you equip the full set, grant extra levels to certain character skills. For example, when you equip all four pieces of Captain Marvel's Carol Corpse costume set, with at least one piece being six star, you get a set bonus that adds six levels to the skill Photon Blast. Normally, at character level 100, abilities cap at level 15. The difference the upgrade makes is massive. The regular level 15 version of the Photon Blast skill deals 2,949% damage. By equipping the Carol Corp set, you will add six ability levels, resulting in a level 21 Photon Blast skill, which deals 3,551% damage. That's 600% more damage. Not to mention the other set bonuses, which grant 5.7% attack and 11.6% crit rate. So set bonuses are a big deal. So how does this factor into regional pieces? Well, unlike non-regional costume sets, regional sets don't upgrade skills. They upgrade classes of skills. Every character has eight standard skills, which are divided into one of three skill classes unique to each character. By equipping a full regional costume set, you can add six levels to two or three different skills simultaneously. If that sounds insanely powerful, that's because it is. Oh, and regional costumes have all around better stats too, just for good measure. For example, a non-regional six star costume helmet will grant 730 plus 18% attack. That same costume helmet as a regional piece will grant 800 plus 19.8% attack instead. In short, regional costumes grant better stats and upgrade multiple character skills at once. They're OP, and that's why they're so rare. The three best ways to acquire regional gear are as follows. Method one, you can of course, whale out and buy lots of costume draw tickets. Please note, I do not recommend this. Method number two, you can craft regional costume boxes at the workshop, which have a very small chance to produce a piece of regional gear. While this crafting requires a handful of resources, the only particularly hard to come by components are sign particles, which you get as part of your daily rewards for completing spec ops every day. By the way, when I say very small chance, I'm talking like one in a hundred. Method number three, you can pull a regional costume piece from the special regional costume box you receive every day from completing spec ops. You can also pull a regional costume piece from the special regional costume boxes you receive each week from your Spec Ops ranked payout. So yeah, Spec Ops rewards are pretty important if you want to give yourself the best odds of acquiring the best costume pieces in the game. 
So getting back to Spec Ops, Spec Ops is actually a rotation of three very different game modes, each with their own subset of rules and strategies. The three versions of Spec Ops are as follows. First, there's Xanderth Defense, which is essentially a horde mode where you protect an objective. Then there's Sakaar Survival, where you essentially fight to survive through several rounds of combat. And finally, there's Hydra Escape, which is essentially a search and rescue. It's not difficult to identify which special operation is running on a given day, but if you want to see which spec ops are coming up, you can check the weekly plan. We will go over specialized tips, including optimal strategies for each version, but first we're going to discuss spec ops as a whole, because there are many features that are present across all three versions that are unique to spec ops. I'll put timestamps in the video description so you can skip to the individual sections for each version, but don't start skipping ahead yet, because first you'll need to know about certain properties of this game mode that, well, the game doesn't actually tell you. That's where I come in. So first, let's talk about some of the general rules and features. Spec Ops is unique in that, unlike other game modes, you must participate as a group of four. You can still queue up solo and wait to be matched with random players, but an operation won't start until four players are ready to load in. Spec Ops also has a unique system for adjusting every participating player up to level 100 for the duration of the operation. We don't know how precisely the hero adjustment works, but we do know that players who are yet to reach level 100 are able to perform equally effectively compared to actual level 100 players, so their adjustments work pretty well. There's one other weird quirk about Spec Ops I should mention, and this one is going to sound like I'm making it up, but I promise I'm not. And that is, you'll always do terrible for your first Spec Op of the day. Now you're right to be asking, um, why? And weirder still, the answer is, we don't know. The shared belief among every high-ranking Spec Ops player is that your damage is cut in half for your first Spec Ops attempt each day. What makes this so strange is that there's absolutely nothing written anywhere in the game that suggests your first Spec Op attempt is any different than future attempts besides your ability to collect a reward upon completion. So I can't tell you why specifically, but I can tell you that we've been paying very close attention to this inexplicable phenomenon, and it's very noticeable. It takes considerably longer to kill absolutely everything during a first run. Again, there is no official reason for this, but it's universally agreed upon to be the case by literally every high-ranking Spec Ops player, so make of that what you will. My own personal theory is that they want to reward players who engage in subsequent attempts by immediately giving them a better score for giving it another try. Anyway, now we're going to go over what I've decided to call the four unifying principles of Spec Ops. As the title suggests, these are four vital tips that will help you succeed in all versions of Spec Ops. Unifying principle number one, it pays to have friends. While I'm aware that many people prefer to play video games alone, there's no denying this fact when it comes to Spec Ops. Coordination is key. The better your group can perform as a team, the better everyone's scores will be. You'll see why this is so important when we break down the version-specific strategies, but the best results in Spec Ops come from having a team of four players that you get comfortable working with every day. My crew actually uses voice chat in case we need to call an audible in the middle of an operation. More importantly, you can actually structure an entire operation to funnel majority of the points into one player. Since you can play Spec Ops as often as you want, you can actually rinse and repeat funneling points into each member of your group until everyone walks away with a really high score. There's one major reason why it pays to take turns rotating high scores. Whichever player finishes with the top score receives a best player bonus, which multiplies their score by 150%. This is why the standard practice for the players at the top of the leaderboard is to do five runs. The first run is a throwaway because it always goes terribly, and the next four runs each focus on funneling points to a different member of the party. Teamwork makes the dream work. Moving on, unifying principle number two, time is of the essence. While we're going to cover individual strategies for scoring higher in each version of Spec Ops soon, there's one overarching strategy that applies to all of them. While the scoring itself differs a bit between the various Spec Ops, they all reward a significant majority of their overall points based on how much time was remaining. This is yet another reason why working as a well-coordinated team is so important. Everyone needs to be in the right places at the right times if you want to finish as quickly as possible. All three versions of Spec Ops have a 10 minute timer and all three can be completed in about three and a half minutes if your team is playing very efficiently. 
even if you miss out on a few easy points early on, finishing just 30 seconds quicker can amount to over 100,000 points getting added to your score. So don't waste any time because every second counts, literally. Unifying principle number three, dress appropriately. While time remaining easily rewards you with the most points, the next best source for points comes from damage on the final boss. Every version of Spec Ops culminates in a supervillain boss fight, and every supervillain boss fight rewards you very generously for dealing lots of damage. Therefore, you want to dress appropriately by equipping items with supervillain damage increase. More final boss damage equals more points. Plus, you'll likely finish quicker. Regular villain damage increase can also help speed up your wave clear, and you also want to make sure you equip both single target and AoE abilities. Single target skills will help you burn down the boss quickly, while AoEs will help clear all of the waves leading up to them. Just be sure to dress for the score you want. And finally, unifying principle number four, be mindful of Arcane Convergium. While Arcane Convergium spawns occur during different phases within the various spec ops, they always present the same way. A message will flash across your screen stating the Arcane Convergium will be created soon and you'll see a countdown timer appear on the left side of the screen, which counts down how long you have until the Arcane Convergium crystals spawn. These crystals are very important if you're looking to get a good score. They come in three different colors, blue, yellow, and red. Every color also comes in two varieties, normal and empowered. You can tell the difference based on whether or not the crystal is glowing. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison so you can see the difference. Now I must admit, at first, I didn't pick up on the fact that some of them glowed. This tidbit was actually pointed out to me by my friend Pablo, right after which he said, you're going to thank me in your video for teaching you that, right? To which I said, I sure will. So make sure to thank Pablo in the comments. Anyway, to remember what the crystals do, just remember the following. Blue for health, yellow for ultimate, red for damage. I'll say that again. Blue for health, yellow for ultimate, red for damage. Specifically, the blue crystal heals you for 50% of your health, with an empowered blue crystal healing you for 100% instead. The yellow crystal restores 50% of your ultimate skill gauge, with an empowered yellow crystal restoring 100% instead. And finally, the red crystal increases your attack by 100%, with an empowered red crystal increasing it by 200% instead. Red crystal buffs last 60 seconds and don't stack with one another. If you pick up a second red crystal, you'll reset the duration of the buff. If you pick up an empowered red crystal, it will override your normal red crystal and you'll get the bigger attack boost instead. Note that you have to attack the crystal first to crack open the buff, then walk close enough to the buff to actually absorb it. A rookie mistake I often see is when a player flies over to a crystal, breaks it open, and then flies off without actually collecting the buff. So there, I just saved you from potentially looking silly. Anyway, playing around the crystals properly can make a huge difference. I often find myself holding on to big abilities until crystals spawn in the hopes that I can snag a red crystal and then let loose with my highest damage abilities to score massive point gains. So be sure to be mindful of the Arcane Convergium. And that concludes the four unifying principles of Spec Ops, which means now it's time to break down some of my patented pro strats for each of the individual Spec Ops. As a reminder, there are timestamps in the video description to skip to a given Spec Op. We'll start with some pro strats for Xanderth Defense. Xanderth Defense is a pretty straightforward one. The only way to fail this spec op is to have your Convergence engine completely destroyed. If you die, you'll have to wait 10 seconds to respawn, and you'll be deducted 10,000 points, so try not to die. There are four phases. In phase one, waves of Outriders will spawn from two of three gates, left, right, and center, indicated by a red glow. Ideally, you want one player covering each of the two spawn points, one player cleaning up any that slip by those two, and one player protecting the Convergence engine itself. While you do get points for health remaining on the Convergence engine, it's not a significant amount of points, so don't stress if it takes a bit of damage. The only other thing worth mentioning is that certain Outriders that spawn are golden and therefore worth more points. In Phase 2, you'll want to spread out across the center of the map to destroy Outrider invasion pods as quickly as you can. You'll want to ignore the mobs here and just focus out those pods. As soon as you clear them all, you're on to Phase 3. Phase 3 is very similar to Phase 1, except now you'll also have to be dodging incoming airstrikes, which present as red indicators shortly before presenting as pain. Toward the end of this phase, you'll want to have your designated high score pick up a red crystal in preparation for the final boss, Call Obsidian. Phase 4 is the boss fight, 
Make sure to splash Cull with a few quick AoEs right when he spawns to ensure that you destroy the Outrider invasion pods that spawn with him. Then ignore everything else and focus single target abilities on Cull Obsidian himself. As soon as Cull falls, the spec op ends. GG. Next we'll cover some pro strats for Sakaar Survival. Sakaar Survival is my personal favorite, and the only way to fail it is to, well, fail to survive. You get 5 lives shared across your entire team, and if your health reaches 0, you lose 10,000 points and then you respawn in 10 seconds. However, there's a catch. In Sakaar Survival, your teammates can revive you. It takes about 3 seconds to revive a teammate, and you'll receive 5,000 points for doing so. More importantly, you'll avoid losing one of your team's 5 lives, as you only actually lose one when a teammate falls and does not get revived, resulting in a respawn. This operation also has 4 phases. Phase 1, you'll face a Sakaran giant boar. This one is pretty straightforward, just watch out for his charging. In Phase 2, you'll face the twins, Vulcan and Kanao. I recommend having all 4 teammates choose one of the twins and focusing them out, so that the other is easier to manage. The easiest way to get in trouble here is to be attacking one twin without realizing the other is about to smash you. Phase 3 sees you face off against a horde of Sakaran insects, as well as an assortment of turrets around the perimeter. I suggest each player attack their own turret immediately, before regrouping in the center to clear out all of the bugs with AoEs. Oh, and I definitely recommend dodging right at the start of this phase, when you see the turrets lining up their beams. And finally, Phase 4 is the final boss fight. Although this spec op actually comes with a twist. By default, the final boss of Sakaar Survival is Ares. And like in any other spec op, you want to burn down Ares as fast as possible, and when he falls, the operation ends. However, about that twist I mentioned. If you manage to reach Phase 4 with all 5 of your team's lives intact, you'll trigger a hidden boss instead. You get to fight War Machine. But like, Sakaran Mecha Tank War Machine. Not only is his fight more interesting, but you'll actually receive an additional 100,000 points at the end for scoring a hidden boss defeat. So, you know, try not to die. Finally, let's discuss some pro strats for Hydra Escape. Hydra Escape is an interesting one, and for many, their least favorite. It's definitely unique, and I appreciate what they were going for, but this one ends up being very RNG dependent, and it often takes a bit of luck to get a particularly good score. What I'm saying is that most people dislike this one because they end up having to replay it a bunch. Anyway, the only way to fail this operation is essentially to take too long rescuing all of the civilians. You'll see a 60 second timer labeled Kidnap Civilians appear below the remaining civilians count. If you don't rescue all of the remaining civilians before the Kidnap Civilians timer reaches zero, you'll lose two of your 10 civilian lives. Whether you fail to save 20 civilians, or you were only missing a single civilian, Either way, you'll lose 2 of the 10 civilian lives once the timer reaches 0. If this happens 4 more times, you will have allowed too many civilians to die and you'll fail the operation. If you die, you'll respawn 10 seconds later and you'll lose 10,000 points. The challenge is locating all of the civilians as quickly as possible. Like the other spec ops, this one has 4 phases. Phase 1 and 2 focus on rescuing civilians, Phase 3 is a mini boss, and Phase 4 is the final boss fight. When it comes to phases 1 and 2, the locations of the civilians are randomized. For any given attempt, different sections of the map may be more heavily concentrated than others. This is one element of the RNG involved in this spec op. To rescue a civilian, you'll have to kill any Hydra enemies nearby, and once you see blue exclamations appear over their heads, then you have to travel close enough to them to rescue them. A huge rookie mistake I often see occurs when a player flies into an area, nukes all the enemies, flies over a bunch of the civilians, and then leaves. However, they often leave one or two civilians behind, as they didn't actually take the time to fly over to them. This can waste a ton of time, because that player will assume they've already cleared the area, resulting in a wild goose chase for a couple missing civilians who often never get found. So I'll repeat, make sure to thoroughly clear an area. It will save you time in the long run, I promise. Ideally, you want all four teammates to spread out and go in four different directions, covering as much ground as possible and rescuing as many people as possible. However, there's no way to determine ahead of time who will cover an area densely packed with civilians scoring tons of points, and who will end up covering a lot of ground while only saving a handful of people, resulting in a pitiful score. Here are some tips for being more efficient during these first two phases. First, and most importantly, watch your minimap. Civilians show up as white silhouettes on the minimap, so you can quickly spot where any stragglers are hiding, 
and you can quickly identify which areas are densely populated with civilians. This leads into the next tip, check every alleyway. One reason new players tend to fail is because they don't check the narrow alleyways. These entrances are often fairly well hidden at first glance, but can easily be seen on the minimap and can lead you to a back alley that's mobbing with civilians. Another tip, along the back wall of the map, there's an area blocked off by fencing and panels. The only way into this area is a narrow door at ground level. This area often gets overlooked as it's a sort of false wall. Sometimes there are enemies spawned behind this false wall, in which case you have to take the time to go back there and kill those enemies in order to rescue the civilians. Oftentimes, however, there are no enemies, only civilians. If this is the case, you can actually fly alongside the wall, which will get you close enough to rescue those civilians without having to take the detour. One final tip for phases one and two, rescue Rocket Raccoon. In each of the first two phases, at some point you will see a yellow message saying Rocket Raccoon is being chased by Hydra. As soon as you see this, you want to immediately keep an eye on your minimap. Rocket Raccoon can spawn in a handful of different areas and is a moving target, but he's easy to spot as a bright yellow silhouette on the minimap. Rescuing Rocket Raccoon scores you an immediate 20,000 points. Rescuing Rocket Raccoon during both of the first two phases is an easy way to have a strong score going into the later phases, which brings us to phase three, where you'll fight an enhanced Hydra Dreadnought. This phase is pretty straightforward, except for what happens immediately afterward. There's two things to be mindful of here. First, it's very likely that Arcane Convergium spawns toward the end of this fight. Make sure your designated point leader picks up a red crystal in preparation for the final boss fight. Additionally, once you've downed the mini boss, a gate behind him opens up to reveal a bunch of civilians. You won't trigger phase four until you rescue all of those civilians, so make sure to fan out and rescue them immediately. Whoever is grabbing the crystals will want to stay behind to pick up their buff, as the final phase teleports everyone to another location on the map. Phase four is pretty standard, melt the boss, win the op. This time you're facing off against Arnim Zola, and as with all of the other spec ops, you can make up a significant amount of points just by doing a ton of damage to the final boss. And that concludes my list of pro tips for scoring higher in spec ops. If you found this video helpful, go ahead and feed the algorithm overlords by slapping that like button, consider helping out with a channel sub, and maybe even leave a comment thanking Pablo. Otherwise, this video has gone on long enough, so I will see you guys real soon. Until next time.